Welcome everyone to DCYO Presents, our weekly in-depth interview with DC Youth Orchestra Program artists about what inspires them. I am Liz Shergan, your host and the Executive Director of DCYOP. On today's show, we are joined by DCYOP Artistic Director, Evan Ross Salomon. Hi, Evan. Hi, Liz. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. We're excited to have you. Evan normally is the producer of the show, so now he is both the producer and the guest. He has also curated a very interesting video list for us today. For each of the videos, we will show a short segment. Later this week, we will post the show's reporting and complete listening list on our YouTube channel. We really want DCYO Presents to be an interactive experience, and so we will be answering some of our viewers' questions throughout the show. If you have a question or comment for Evan, please type it into the chat box. We also want to hear your reactions to <coughs> today. As a note, our audience is mostly children and families, so please be kind and thoughtful. Arles, say hello, Arles. Hi, everyone. Our Assistant Director of Operations will man monitor today's chat. So, Evan, let's get started. Most of our viewers know you as DCYOP's Artistic Director, but your first experience with DCYOP actually dates back several years. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's very true. So, when I had just sort of started to get my legs about me in terms of being a professional musician and teacher here in the DC area. I was actually hired to be a after school clarinet teacher by the founder of DC Youth Orchestra program, Lynn McLean, which I was, I believe this took place in 2003. So it was, uh, it was quite a few years back and I was hired to be the group class clarinet teacher for a after school program that took place, I forget the name of the elementary school, but it was right down there on 16th street. And it was at the corner of 16th and Mozart. And I was a real wise guy at the time. So I, and I just moved to DC. I didn't really understand the difference between Northwest, Northeast, Southeast, et cetera. So I called Lynn McLean on the phone and I said, uh, I'm not sure how to get there. The, the Google maps is, not telling me, he said, it's at the corner of 16th and Mozart. Are you familiar with the term Mozart? So I said, I think I've heard the name. I made my way down to that school and uh, started teaching for the DC Youth Orchestra program. And it was a lot of fun. I remember how to, we had a recital at the, end of the, at the end of the semester. I had a very, very gifted student actually in that class named Jaime. And I was able to teach him to play the Pink Panther. Wow. So it was very, very fun. And then over the years, I've done a lot of other subbing uh, and sort of showing up when some of my musical colleagues who were on the faculty here at DCYOP couldn't make it. And I did some conducting and some coaching. And then in 2014, I was uh, lucky enough to, to get the job here as artistic director. And, you know, the rest is history. So it was, there is a, a long history with me in the, in the DC Youth Orchestra program. That's, that's wonderful. And um, my understanding is that you grew up in a musical household. Is that correct? Yeah, my dad, big shout out to my dad, who was a, a really fantastic trombone player and a very natural kind of innate musician. And, and my dad really, really showed me the way in, uh, in music. But I did start playing the clarinet in, uh, at my elementary school in the public schools. And but, but short, shortly thereafter, I got uh, my, my, first, my first private instructor and started taking lessons and uh, just got really, really, really interested and inspired by playing clarinet. And I couldn't really put the thing down starting at about age eight or nine. So it's with your dad that you were first exposed to a professional orchestra concert, correct? That is correct. Uh, my, uh, one of the best memories I have of growing up in, uh, in the Philadelphia area was going down to the Academy of Music to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra perform. And I think around 1992 or 93, my dad took me, I believe probably my brother, who also was a, a musician, he played the trombone very well. And, and we went to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra play Mahler's Fifth Symphony. And at that time, you could wait on the side of the street on the corner of Broad and Locust Street where the Academy of Music was, get in line a 
a couple hours early and wait for a $4 ticket to hear literally the great Philadelphia Orchestra, one of the greatest orchestras in the world. And we went to that concert and I just remember being blown away. And, and I was thinking about this, the sound of that timpani in Mahler's Fifth Symphony in that concert. I think that is still stuck with me as to what I want to hear for an orchestral timpanist. And uh, from that point on, I knew that this was the place I wanted to be. I wanted to be hearing the Philadelphia Orchestra. So I did whatever I could. At first, I was like, Dad, please, please, let's go. Let's go hear the orchestra. I don't, it's okay that it's a piano concerto and there might not be a clarinet part. I don't care. I just want to go hear this orchestra. So every week, to the best of my ability, I went to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra with my dad many times and then my brother. And then when I got old enough to drive, and as soon as I had the wherewithal to get myself downtown from, from my house, which is a 15 minute drive, I, uh, I tried to go every week. And in doing so, I was so lucky and so fortunate to hear just some of the greatest conductors and soloists. So at the very beginning, it was still Ricardo Muti as music director. And then we saw the new music director come in, which was Wolfgang Sovalish. May he rest in peace. He just passed away. And we heard many performances by Sovalish, but also really great people like uh, Simon, Sir Simon Rattle. I heard Simon Rattle do Mahler's Second Symphony. I went Friday night for the concert. And then, you know, I said, yeah, I'm going to go again. I went Saturday night as well. Same scheme. I, we saw Slatkin. We saw Mark Wigglesworth make his American debut. Uh, Vladimir Ashkenazi, not to mention all the great violinists. Perlman, Zuckerman. We saw Yo-Yo Ma. Uh, one, wonderful, wonderful experience, formative and still sticks with me to this very day. I remember those performances and it was just, just great Philadelphia Orchestra. So for, for some of our viewers who have been with us since the beginning, they'll know that Mahler is a theme, but another theme in our DCY Presents is actually your first record. And my understanding is that first video we're gonna see is of the Philadelphia Orchestra playing your first and favorite record as a kid. Yeah, so, so like, like, like Liz said, quite a few of the guests have mentioned that some of their early inspiration and, and knowledge was gleaned from their respective dad's record collection. And that was also true. My dad had a, a pretty good record collection that had, um, a lot of diverse stuff in it. Uh, he did not only listen to classical music, he listened to a lot of classic jazz, especially stuff from the 60s, especially John Coltrane, who was a huge influence on, on me and my clarinet playing actually. And um, lots of uh, sort of uh, fusion music. My dad performed a lot as a classical musician on trombone, but also, especially when he was a college student and afterwards performed in a lot of jazz, bands, jazz, big bands, and, and, and contemporary ensembles. So he had all this fusion, Mahavishnu Orchestra, uh, a lot of Indian music, which really provoked my interest in sort of Eastern philosophy. I would read a lot of books about Eastern philosophy and meditation. But for whatever reason, the first record I was drawn to was a four records set of the orchestral works of Brahms. So the four symphonies and the overtures, etc. cetera. And, um, the one that struck me as being very beautiful was the first symphony. And this particular record was the NBC symphony with uh, Toscanini. And I think it was a, a recording that was probably from the forties and I believe it was a monaural recording. But uh, I was very taken by the, the Brahms first symphony because the third movement started with a clarinet solo. And it was described to me, of course, by my father. He said, son, this is one of the most beautiful clarinet melodies ever composed. And when I heard that, I said, yeah, this is, again, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to make music like that. So another thing that's special about this recording, you're going to hear that clarinet solo played by a performer who is the most dear to me and who became my teacher later on. It's Anthony Giliotti. And it's been about 20 years ago since he he left us, but every time I play and every time I think about interpreting a piece of music, I hear um, the words of, of Mr. Giliotti, who would say, you know, Evan, it's not about just playing the clarinet, it's about singing. 
It's about making the clarinet an extension of the human voice. And I think you will hear some of that quality in, in his playing, especially in this performance. So this is the Philadelphia Orchestra from 1993 with Ricardo Muti. And I was reading the comments in this video and it turns out that on this concert, Yo-Yo Ma was the soloist and he sits in the orchestra and plays the Brahms with the orchestra. So should we check it out? Yeah, so spot Yo-Yo Ma. Look for Evan's teacher and for Yo-Yo Ma. All right.
So we had some comments that it really, really does sing and, and that it does. I think it's a pretty amazing thing and, and how formative to be able to see the Philadelphia Orchestra week after week. Yeah, and, and this era of Philadelphia Orchestra um, was sort of the end of the era of what really had been developing for decades, the quote unquote uh, Philadelphia sound that started with Stokowski actually back in 1915 or 19 or some, something a long time ago, and then evolved into Eugene Ormandy and then to Ricardo Muti. And during the Ricardo Muti period, a lot of those old principal players, including Mr. Giliotti and, and some of the other folks, sort of retired and, and a new group of just amazing musicians sort of became the principles of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And now we're actually in a phase where those guys are, are leaving and, and, and some new incredible people were there. But to be able to hear those guys change their roles, here's another quick story. My dad studied with the guy who was principal trombone of Philadelphia Orchestra. His name was Glenn Dotson. And just like a, an institution into, unto himself, he had a swimming pool with a trombone uh, tiled in the bottom of it. And uh, anyway, so we would hear him. And then the new guy came in, Nitsan Haroz. And when we heard that, we were like, oh, wow. The, uh, the level of the playing in that orchestra was just so inspiring and so high. What a great, great group. So the Philadelphia Orchestra was not the only orchestra that was a big presence in your life. In fact, you were a member of youth orchestra. Am I correct in that? Absolutely. In many, many ways, being a part of the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra was also incredibly formative for a number of reasons. So the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra at that time, now right now, it's got a, it's a lot more similar actually to DC Youth Orchestra than it was back then. I think now they have seven orchestras and they're really doing a great job of getting a lot of students in there who want to learn and, and, and I'll give them a big shout out to Louis Scalione for, for making that happen. But at the time when I was auditioning around this time, I started in 1993 to audition. It took me six auditions to get into the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra. So you had a spring and a fall audition. I had to go through three years of that before they finally accepted me into the orchestra with a caveat. And they said, well, you know, nice job. But we have a lot of other clarinet players that are already, they're much better than you, much more experienced than you. So if you want to join, you have to also play the bass clarinet part. So I said, fine. And that turned out to be a really, really good thing. And, and I really grew into the bass clarinet, got to play a lot of solos while I was in there on bass clarinet, and a lot of great repertoire. And, uh, and made some of my lifelong friends in that orchestra, including a violinist who was in there who became my wife uh, quite a few years down the road. But so th to the kids who are listening, don't, don't forget, you never know who is going to be sitting next to you at Youth Orchestra. In fact, the, the, the person who played clarinet next to me, fantastic musician, Agnes Marchione, uh, fortune would have it that I sat next to her again in the when I played in a professional orchestra in Delaware Symphony. And the funniest thing was we played one of the same pieces we played in Philadelphia Youth Orchestra. So the network that you make in youth orchestra are people that could be, be helpful and be your colleagues for many, many decades. So yeah, Philadelphia Youth Orchestra was a, an amazing experience. And with the, some of the students in Philadelphia Orchestra now are really principals of major, major symphonies. So it's just fantastic. So Evan, you actually have a video of the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra and several other youth orchestras that you're gonna share uh, with us today that has both you and Sarah in it. Yeah. And it's from a pretty unique experience. In fact, your first time out of the country. So tell us about that. Yeah, so this was just truly an incredible and amazing experience. And thanks to whoever, whatever member of the South African symphony that must have also been, and I'll explain, for posting this video, because I couldn't find this anywhere. But uh, so in 1998, there was the World Youth Olympics in Moscow, Russia. And in conjunction with that, there was a music festival, which they translated from the Russian as the world is orchestra. So that's what this was. And there was about a dozen youth orchestras 
that all arrived in Moscow. You were talking about Israel Youth Orchestra, Canada, Philadelphia Youth Orchestra. There was another program at the time called the American Russian Youth Orchestra that's participating. I believe there's an orchestra from England. There's an orchestra from Egypt who I still am in contact with the gentleman who was the conductor of that orchestra. There's a South African orchestra. There's a lot of orchestras. And we all played together in what they described as the largest youth orchestra ever assembled and performing on the largest stage ever assembled, which was built in the middle of Red Square, you know, right in front of St. Basil, right there on the Khatni Riyadh. Just an incredible sight to behold. And the whole group played together, pictures at an exhibition, and then a medley of kind of like classical music greatest hits that starts with the Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony. And the conductor on this occasion is none other than Valery Gergiev, one of the world's sort of most famous conductors. He, he's as, as famous as it gets in terms of conductors. You're talking about Dudamel, and Simon Rattle and, and Gurgiev as being sort of the Mount Rushmore of guys conducting orchestras right now. And I had just not seen anything like the energy and the vitality that Gurgiev had and the way he dealt with the orchestra, even with what you're going to see this video and it's going to be kind of amazing how many people were playing together. But the way he dealt with the orchestra and, and, and taught sticks with me today as well. So I, this is a, just a really remarkable thing. I, I, I occasionally run into other musicians and say, oh yeah, yeah, I, I was there with the Canada Orchestra. Oh, I was there with the, the Russian American Youth Orchestra. And everybody's just recollect this as an extremely inspirational uh, event. Okay, so let's, let's watch the video. And, and Evan, maybe uh, if it, we can see you on the video, but there are like 40 clarinetists. So maybe in the chat, pop, point out when we see you. Spot. Me, I shall do my best. Okay. Thank you. 
pretty active chat. And I think we can all agree that that is probably the largest orchestra that any of us have ever seen. What an amazing experience it must have been. You know, Liz, I think we need to do something like that for all the youth orchestras in the United States. Once we get through this period of separation, we need to just have a massive, a massive orchestra and someone like Gergiev could conduct it. Part two, that would be amazing. Great idea. Do you think he was on a podium that was maybe like eight feet off the ground? How did you see him? <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't really remember exactly what happened with the podium, but uh, what I do know is that uh, they, they, were, they were apparently building that stage for quite some time. In, in in red square like that and there was a mr giles wrote in the chat that uh you know good thing it didn't rain and i have this recollection of they were predicting rain and it was drizzling and it turns out the uh they you know we did get the concert in but they were saying well don't worry because the military will just salt the clouds if there's a problem and i was like oh yeah. we didn't know that was a thing but there we go I had no idea that the military could salt the crowds. It's it's funny that you say that because we have a rain story that's a good transition into the next segment in that you and I both went on tour with the youth orchestra in 2016, 2017 to Chile. Yeah. Next week is DCYOP's college week. We're gonna be celebrating our seniors and where they're headed to school. And I was reading in some of their responses, some of their favorite memories. And this actually is one of their favorite memories. Evan, do you want to tell the story about uh, the island outside of Valdivia in which it was, quote, never going to rain? Yeah, you know, that was a, that's a great memory. You know, me uh, and Liz and Mariano and Rashida, we were all out there. We got, we took these sort of like fit, little fishing boats. There's no road or anything. You go out to this, essentially an island that has a, a fort on it, some like 400 year old fort. And we're gonna play a concert in front of this fort. And we're seeing out in the distance, just some very ominous looking clouds. But our, our hosts in Chile are saying, no, 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 it's gonna be fine. It definitely won't rain. Now that was not the case. So we start doing the concert and, uh, and Maestro Valles gives the downbeat. He says, let's go. Concert time is now. We played a couple of the pieces and then the heavens just uh, opened up and all the students ran into the one building, one closed building on the, sh on the island <laughs> to, to, get, to, get, uh, to get some shelter. Meanwhile, the adults, we, we took the brunt of it outside, but. Uh, you know, those are the memories that, that stick with you. So that was a tremendous, tremendous trip down to Chile. And that's just like um, the experience I had going in Russia. I, I hope that a lot of our students had a similar type of feeling of inspiration from that type of trip. Yeah. Well, uh, so in, in spirit of college week. What happened after you graduated high school? What happened next in your musical life? Yeah, so I was in the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra and I also went to a very nice uh, high school, Ben Salem High School, with, which had a uh, really nice music program. So if you're listening out there, Douglas Fitzgerald, thank you very much. Great band teacher, taught me so much stuff. You know, in, uh, in high school, I was practicing clarinet like crazy, but also composing music and also doing some conducting. I would, you know, conduct the school string orchestra, conduct the school band. And it was a really, really wonderful, wonderful time. And there were quite a few other students that also were headed for a path um, in, in, as a musician. So I uh, auditioned for a number of uh, colleges and conservatories, a lot of the usual suspects, and I had a fair share of success, but it turned out that um, the teacher who I mentioned early, earlier in the interview, uh, Anthony Giuliotti, had just this, accepted a, a post as being the clarinet teacher at Peabody Conservatory of Music, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. So I was fortunate enough to be offered a fairly, fairly sizable scholarship, and I said, let's do it. Let's, let's go to Baltimore and study with this guy who I'd been admiring, I, I did start studying with him a very a, a little bit towards the end of high school, but uh, I had a chance to really become one of his 
students uh, truthfully. And so I went to Baltimore and studied at Peabody for, uh, for four years. And sadly, in my, uh, in my last year, in my senior year, Mr. Giuliotti passed away. And it's really, it was really unfortunate timing because the disease that he uh, passed away from, if, you, if he were to have gotten that now, he would be cured rapidly and would have been fine. But uh, unfortunately, that was not the case at that time in 2001. And so we got a new teacher who was a fantastic gentleman, Paul Sagan from the National Symphony Orchestra. And Paul Sagan is actually how I made it down to Washington because he said, you know, I was not sure what to do, what to do about grad school. He said, come on, Evan, you got to stick with it. Go to University of Maryland and study with Lauren Kitt. And, and Lauren Kitt was also a student of Anthony Giuliotti, as was Paul Sagan. So it was really staying in the family. And I went I was, again, very, very lucky. I'm very grateful. I got a, a full paid scholarship to go to University of Maryland. And I also had a stipend that I was able to, to help me live on a little bit while I was down there. And I got to study with Lauren Kitt at University of Maryland and got my uh, master's degree. Well, that's awesome. And it, it's wonderful how you stayed in the family and how connected the music world is. And I think that yeah. I hope that's a wonderful message for all our students out there, that there is um, scholar, there are scholarships available if you work hard. One thing that you told me while you were at Peabody is you spent a whole semester studying one piece. And that's yeah. really one of the pieces you wanted to select today because it's one of your most influential, one of the most influential pieces in your life. So tell us about that and what we're about to hear. So at Peabody, I had sort of a favorite professor and his name was Dr. Sprenkel. And he taught a lot of music history and analysis class. And I really just enjoyed his style. And he was a, also a very, very skilled, excuse me, and very skilled composer, really just an excellent and a brilliant teacher. You know how when you get a teacher who you connect with and you just, it's like a joy to learn and you really look forward to that class. And that's how it was with this class. So this particular class was all about the Bach mass in B minor. And you know, I've, they sometimes they ask this question, well, if you had to be on a desert island and only have one piece of music that you could take with you, my choice would be the mass in B minor by Bach. Because honestly, it's got enough in there for seven, eight, maybe 10 pieces. It's just such a fantastic work. So I spent a whole semester um, studying this piece. And since that time, I just, keep going back to this work and back to this work and always hearing and finding new things. And when I was in that class, it was recommended that we studied the work based on the recording made by John Elliott Gardner and the London, is it London Classical Players, I think, and the Monteverdi Choir. And this recording was made in 1985 and is a phenomenal, phenomenal piece. So I really recommend that you check that out. The only thing that you should possibly substitute that for is John Elliott Gardner's recording of 2015 of the same piece, 30 years later, he did it again. And there is, it's a great to compare and contrast those two interpretations. So I wanted to share with you a live performance by this group with John Elliott Gardner conducting of the culminating movement of the mass. Uh, the words are Dona Nobis Pacem grant us peace. And this piece of music, so I can give you a little s s tidbit from Dr. Sprenkel's analysis class of this work. This is an eight voiced fugue. So all the voices essentially play the same material, but they enter sort of in a staggered way. And you'll hear it. Six of the voices of the fugue are played by the chorus, or sung by the chorus rather. And then the last two voices, voices seven, eight, come in in a very heroic and just glorious fashion with trumpet. And uh, I know there's some trumpet players listening out there. So you'll see these trumpets, and this is a recording on a performance using period instruments. So they're similar to the type of trumpet that would have been used in a box era. <laughs>
That's really beautiful. What a fantastic piece of music. And it sounds so glorious and beautiful, yet the technical skill compositionally that Bach puts in this piece is, is beyond compare. So I hope that all of our viewers take the time, um, as I encourage every show, to listen to the full piece, which we will post online. And Evan, the next piece that you've selected for us is <coughs> your favorites. And in fact, the first thing you ever searched for on the internet was this piece. So tell us about that and what we're <laughs> here. Yeah, so we had an old copy of History of Western Music by Donald J. Grell sitting around at the house. So I started reading that a lot as a, as a kid. And I came across this uh, composer, Olivier Messiaen, who subsequently I've performed his music many, many times. But uh, this particular piece is called Toranga Lila. And when I heard this word and I said, oh, that's a Sanskrit word, I became just fascinated by this piece. It's about an 80 minute symphony. It was composed in the late forties and actually premiered by Leonard Bernstein in Boston Symphony. And it is one of the most insane pieces because it has the, one of the early electronic instruments in there, the Ones Martineau, which sort of sounds like a theremin, but it's played by a keyboard. And I mean, I could talk all day about this piece. I, that's how much I love this piece. And I did, when I was a college student, I made a, a journey back to Philadelphia Orchestra to hear Andrew Davis and the Philadelphia Orchestra conduct this piece. And the ovation at the end was sort of unlike anything I had heard before. And then actually the NSO played it maybe 10 years ago. And it's another fantastic performance. So I just listened to some of this. I'm going to play the fifth movement, which is a really exuberant, movements and the title is joy of the blood of the stars so messian had a very very spiritual kind of religious sense and it, it has to do with that great joy uh that he he experienced and the other interesting thing about messian is that he was synest had synesthesia meaning that when he heard music he actually perceived or i'm not exactly sure how it works but perceived or saw different colors in his head and a lot of the sounds he creates relates to those to those colors so this is going to be the fifth movement of uh, of the Taranga Lila symphony and I hope you enjoy this we may not have time to listen to it all but I wanted you to hear some of this because this is sort of in second place to the Bach mass in B minor maybe this piece for me
we had some comments that it sounded like aliens, like Halloween. It definitely, it does sound a little bit out of this world, which I think was Messian's intention, right? Well, the, uh, the owns that instrument that sounds like the theremin certainly contributes to that. And, uh, but can you imagine what it's like to be able to hear music like this in your head and conceive of this and then write it down? And it, it, the, the level of genius of Messiaen and Bach is just so astounding that they could perceive such a sound as that and then have the skill as a composer to, 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 to recreate it and give it to us as musicians. What a gift. It really, really is. So after you graduated Maryland with your master's degree, you set off in your career of a musician of many talents. Um, and so I think this is a great time for us to shift our focus to you as a clarinet player, because you know most of our students know you in the artistic director role up at the podium or helping guide them through their path in DCYOP. And some of them have come to our concerts, but talk about what it's like to be a professional clarinetist. So I, uh, you know, have been uh, essentially performing in, in, in a multifaceted sort of way. I, many times I performed as a member of a symphony orchestra. I played for many seasons as a, as a, as a performer with the Delaware Symphony and often appeared with other orchestras as, as a sub and including like orchestras like the National Symphony or from time to time. But over the course of the last couple of decades where I really have made my mark and really felt comfortable and grateful was as a member of different chamber ensembles, most notably, of course, being Inscape, which we can talk about in a second, but uh, playing in the configuration of clarinet and string quartet or clarinet, cello and piano. Some of the great composers wrote some of their best pieces for clarinet in these configurations and over the course of the years I've had a chance to play all these fantastic pieces and work with some just tremendous tremendous musicians who I am inspired by some of whom were guests on this very show and um, and work with our with our students so being able to play chamber music and play recitals from time to time uh, has been has been really wonderful so you know most, pe most professional musicians have a kind of a portfolio of things they do, playing in orchestra, playing in chamber music, and doing a fair amount of, of teaching, which was all the things I did, especially up till 2014, when I became the artistic director of, of DC Youth Orchestra, and then my main focus became, became doing that. And, um, but uh, what, what I wanted to show you today is a, is a recent performance, it's not too, from just a few years ago, from a new festival that my, myself and uh, my wife, Sarah, who's a, just a virtuoso and fantastic violinist, and, and a few of the other people that you may recognize, including Mr. Sherbo. And in this video, I'm actually performing with Ali Osborne, who was the soloist on the Dvorak Violin Concerto a couple months ago with the, um, with the youth orchestra. And so this is a performance from the Jackson Hole Chamber Music Festival. This is, the this is the first performance ever of Jackson Hole Chamber Music Festival, which takes place in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. If you have a chance to go out to Jackson Hole, definitely take advantage of that. It's one of the most beautiful places in the United States. It's just very beautiful, right in the shadow of the Grand Teton Mountains. And this particular piece is called Museum Pieces. The, the concert we were playing was focused on the relationship of music and art. And uh, it's for clarinet and string quartet. This is the first movement. And you're gonna hear, it's very, very sort of raw and a little bit angry. And then there's a, uh, a clarinet solo. So, you know, if you're a composer and you wanna write something very raw and angry, you can always put a clarinet solo in there and it'll work out. Um, and this piece is by uh, a, a composer named Philip Rhodes who we never heard of and we didn't know this guy at all, but we had a, he had a piece that fit the parameters of this concert. So we put this on YouTube and sure enough, a few months later, he found the video and said, oh, I, I love the performance and can I put it on my website? And we said, have a great, 
have a great time and go for it. So I'll see what you think of this piece. This is um, really a fantastic piece. It was totally unknown to me before, uh, before this event and uh, turned out to be just a really, really expressive and wonderful piece. Yeah, you know, you can't just play Mozart and Brahms. Well, you could, but uh, you know, the audience does enjoy some things like that. And you know, you never, you know, when you play a, a performance of a new piece like that, a lot of times the audience is completely amazed. So that was a really fun experience. So speaking of new pieces and new music, we heard last week on our show a little bit about Inscape, which is yeah. the chamber orchestra that you and Richard Sherbo um, started. And so tell us a little bit about the evolution of Inscape and the two roles you play so that we have a better sense of what Evan does with Inscape. Yeah, sure. So um, Inscape is a, uh, is a, um, a chamber orchestra that uh, has essentially um, 15 members, 15 or 16 members. We're all very tight knit group and we play about 15 to 20, maybe more concerts a year in a lot of different formats. But and aside from being the artistic director of the DC Youth Orchestra program, that's pretty much my other professional job uh, that I spend most of my time working with. And I actually serve as the, not only the clarinet soloist, but also the executive director of that group. And um, 
we have been very, very fortunate. We, we had a record contract. We made four very, very beautiful albums. One of our albums was actually Grammy nominated. And it was a, a really, really lucky break on that one. But, you know, it, a lot of times the hard work pays off. But our group focuses on playing a lot of contemporary music. And what I like to describe it as contemporary music that rocks. And um, one of the piece, one of the composers that we have been working with for quite a long time is Nathan Lick and DeCrusatis, great friend of mine and Mr. Sherbos, and he is a fantastic composer. And I wanted to play for you some of his piece today called Oblivion, which is a, which is a, uh, a chamber symphony that he wrote in 2014, or maybe it must have been 2013, to be part of our uh, second album, which is called American Aggregate. You can check that out on Spotify if you're interested. And this p particular piece of music is written to describe the hustle and bustle of city life, especially from in New York City where he uh, lived. And I think when you hear the interlocking passage work, and, and it's a very virtuosic piece. And I remember getting for the first time, you know, the score to this piece. And Nathan Lincoln Dickerson said to us, well, what do you think? And Richard and I said, well, I, we don't think we could play this piece because it was just such a dense score. Uh, and then actually, as we started to get into it, we realized, oh, this piece actually is a lot, a lot of great stuff in it. It's actually great. And now kind of become one of our um, signature pieces. And uh, so this performance actually from the, if you were watching last week, I hope you had tuned in to see the Black Band by Dan Visconti. This is another performance from that, uh, that concert. So Inscape was in good form that, that day. And on this recording, you're gonna see some of your, the same familiar faces. You just have uh, Derek Powell's principal violin, Sarah D'Angelo is uh, second violin, uh, and, and Aaron Ludwig, our, our coach is the cello, and Chandra Cervantes is the horn player. And of course, I am playing uh, the clarinet part. So I hope you enjoy this. Uh, we'll play the first movement of this piece, and, and um, I think you'll hear that uh, interlocking sort of city aspect to this piece. Thank you. 
awesome piece in fact that all of inscape's albums are pretty amazing and i hope that everyone checks them out on spotify yeah we used to say you can buy these uh compact discs at our next concert but we don't even sell compact discs or we don't even have them anymore so yeah they're all available for free on youtube or spotify just check out inscape chambers and i can also tell you we have a great performance of philip glass the fall of the house of usher which actually liz was on the performance of that piece we did in Washington. It's actually one of the best performances in Washington I could remember. It was, uh, it was described in the Washington Post as a bunch of goth kids dancing in a warehouse. And we performed the fall. So we re subsequently recorded that piece as well, which you can also hear on uh, Spotify. So if you're interested, definitely check it out. And if you like new music, why not check it out? Because we love sharing it. So we have, you have, you've prepared something to play for us today. Before we get to that, I do want to ask you a question, which I ask, as you know, all of our guests, which, you know, we're in a very challenging period of time right now, one where there's not a lot of clarity on what's going to happen tomorrow or next week. So how can our viewers use music to help them get them through this difficult period? Yeah. Well, I think that <clears throat> the most powerful part about music is its power to allow the human spirit to really shine and to really come forward. And that goes for playing music, and but also for listening to music. And if you take the time each day to listen to some music. And I could definitely suggest Bach 
and start with the mass in B minor if you want. But uh, listening to music and taking some time to reflect upon it. And remember that in this time, the, you know, there is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of very sad and, and, and bad things that we keep seeing time and time again, you know, you turn on the news and it's just terrible. But uh, the one thing that you do have a little bit more of now potentially is some time. So take the time to sit, just sit there and do nothing else and listen to music and let the power of the music just overwhelm you in a way. And so if you listen to the music and you feel a great sense of joy, dance around. And if you feel a great sense of sadness, go ahead and, and cry and then let the music just envelop you. And, and, and I always feel like when I listen to great music, it's like a warm blanket. It's very comfortable and it feels really wonderful. And I also th think that if you have the chance to just sit quietly and reflect um, a little bit each day, I know that we don't know the answer. We don't know when it's gonna end, but uh, minimally what we can do now is just take the time to, to feel uplifted by music. And that can be done by listening and by practicing. Now for me, Practicing has been a really, really great thing during this period because when you're in the hustle bustle of doing DC Youth Orchestra program full time, doing InScape full time, also being a dad and, and, and all the other responsibilities that come in life, you have a little extra time now and I have been forced enough to be able to spend it uh, practicing. And to my students who I will see again soon, I encourage you to practice a lot. So... Thank you for that. And what have you practiced to play for us today? So I've been preparing some music by Bach on my bass clarinet here. Um, and I will ask for forgiveness ahead of time for two things. One, from the cello purists, I'm going to play this in clarinet key. So it's going to be one step lower um, than a cello would play it. And we don't know what the sound quality on Zoom is. It is what it is. I just want to share this with you and, and, and I hope you enjoy it. So this is the Sarabon from Bach uh, Cello Suite number one uh, on bass clarinet.
Thank you, Evan. That was beautiful. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed that. Bach is somebody that uh, you can always play for the rest of your life and find something new every time. Well, Evan, thank you for sharing that today. Thank you for sharing your story today. It was a pleasure to speak with you. If our listeners want to stay in touch, how can they do that? Well, most of our DCYOP family knows where to find me evan at dcyop.org and if you're interested in inscape it's inscape.org simple as that and uh, i'm a pretty easy guy to get in contact with so and you know what i enjoy communicating with our students really really very much so don't be shy and of course when i see you again that will be the best way to get in contact with me so in the coming days, we will post the recording online as well as Evan's complete listening list. We want to know what you thought of today's show. So please take a short survey posted in the chat and some more things to look forward to. If you would like more of Evan, join him tomorrow at 3 p.m. for his next course on listening to music. Evan, do you want to tell us about the theme this week? Sure. We'll be listening to some pieces that were inspired by American jazz and what the real meaning of American jazz is in terms of its use in classical music. So we have a lot of great music to listen to. And I know some of the folks on today join me. So join me tomorrow at three. Looking forward to it. And next week on DC Wild Presents, we'll have a special episode. We'll be joined by our founder, Maestro Lynn McLean. As part of this episode, we will be screening, a, it's a rare screening of the documentary from 1978, Growing Up With Music. And so I hope you will join us. If you would like, we are asking for questions to be submitted in advance, or if you have a story you want to share, particularly a tour story, we have a jot form a, that you can submit your questions and your tour stories that's gonna go up on our website later today. So we encourage everyone to tune in tomorrow and next week. And from all of us here at DCYOP, we wish you a safe and musical week and we are thinking of you as always.